Good morning. Today we're going to talk about nuclear GI scintigraphy. We're going to start with a couple of questions, but as this is pre-recorded, you can stop and read the questions on your own. We will revisit them at the end. So what are our objectives today? We're going to review most of nuclear uh, GI imaging studies, particularly ones that are performed most frequently. We're going to highlight the appropriate uses uh, where they're where they are present, uh, and we will review a couple of protocols involving the liver, um, but the biliary system is a different lecture. Now, there are some caveats. Most of this lecture is from an adult perspective, um, and of course, this is a high-level uh, discussion. A few things we will go a little deeper on, um, but others will just be hitting very high points. Um, I'm going to highlight protocols uh, that uh, that are recommended by either procedure standards or practice parameters, or sometimes both. And many of these studies have other imaging or even non-imaging um, counterparts uh, that will not be covered by this topic. That just ends up being too broad. Let's start with gastric emptying scintigraphy. So this is the most comprehensive and physiologic study for gastric emptying uh, that we have, and it is highly highly accurate and reproducible. Now, why is there a little asterisk there? Well, uh, prior to the standard meal uh, and consensus recommendations uh, from 2009, um, very many protocols uh, were used uh, for gastric emptying, leading to the inability uh, to uh, have patients move from one area to another or even, you know, just one hospital system than another in the same area and have data that could be compared. So key points for gastric emptying, nutrients, salt, acid, all slow the rate of emptying. Once you start having uh, anything other than uh, just plain water and fat slows gastric emptying the most. For liquid and solid emptying, if you do a study where you label both elements uh, and they're taken together, um, the liquid component will empty earlier. We'll talk a little about water only emptying um, and, and, and so don't get confused. Um, if you do have liquid uh, only study, uh, the larger the volume, typically the more rapid the empty time uh, is expected. So what are appropriate uses for gastric emptying? Well, it's a sim symptoms of gastroparesis, whether the patient is diabetic or not. Uh, functional dyspepsia symptoms, and what are those? Uh, they're pretty, uh, pretty nonspecific uh, for a variety of conditions, but upper abdominal pain, discomfort, early society, nausea, vomiting, bloating, postprandial fullness, uh, and those symptoms can overlap with symptoms of gastroparesis. Post-surgical uh, induced dyspepsia, um, including whether there's uh, rapid gastric emptying, um, and this may occur uh, with symptoms of post-surgical gastroparesis or, or if they've cut the, the vagus nerve and symptoms for that. And those are all highly appropriate indications. Other indications may be appropriate in a variety of these uh, from this appropriate use criteria. Here, from a multi, multi, it's a multi society uh, criteria, um, the next greatest uh, amount is post surgical uh, in etiology. Say they've put a neural uh, stimulator or they've uh, done some uh, surgery or procedure that will affect the pylorus. Uh, in those cases, uh, it may be appropriate to do gastric empty as well. So what's the patient preparation? Well, we want them to be fasting for at least four hours. It would be lovely if they fasted since midnight and we're doing this first thing in the morning. Um, glucose control is important and we want uh, the, the uh, blood glucose to be lower than, 100, or than 200 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Uh, well, it's not typically done uh, in, in most uh, Institutions, there are um, literature published for giving patients with uh, higher blood glucoses regular insulin and then going on with imaging. Uh, if you have very high, um, very high blood glucose, it can affect 
gastric emptying. Now, if the patient's diabetic, they also need to plan their medications uh, for what the, um, the, what the meal uh, is, and therefore they need to get data on that beforehand and bring their medications with them. Now, of course, if they're on other medications that can affect gastric emptying, and there's a fair number, uh, we want to, to modify those appropriately. Generally, you're going to stop the prokinetic agents, which many or uh, several are listed here, two days prior. Now, you have to look at the indication of the study uh, because sometimes uh, this is a follow-up gastric emptying on these prokinetic agents to assess the effect of these agents. You need to stop antispasmodics and medicines that delay emptying. Um, opioids uh, are, are a common uh, issue here, and again, for about two days beforehand. Both alcohol and nicotine are known to inhibit gastric emptying. There's not a recommendation uh, for stopping either um, in the uh, procedure standard or practice uh, parameter, uh, though if they refrained um, in a similar fasting time, uh, it would be preferable. So what is the standard meal? It is four ounces of liquid egg whites. And why egg whites? Uh, though you can use two whole eggs, but that is not preferred. It's because the binding uh, of the sulfur colloid is much better uh, with uh, just the egg whites. And as well, uh, you also are going to have two slices of toasted white bread, uh, 30 grams of uh, jelly, which is you know, two kind of regular packets that you might get in a, a restaurant, and 120 milliliters of water. If they have allergies or intolerance to eggs, uh, you can use a, an Ins Insure Plus or a similar um, liquid meal, uh, and, and the values that we'll present later are similar um, to, uh, to a solid meal. You need to eat the meal in less than 10 minutes, and the time to eating should be documented by the technologist, particularly if it's longer than 10 minutes. And you have to eat at least 50% of the meal to have a valid study. Uh, and if the patient uh, does not eat the entire meal, that should also be noted by the technologist. To prepare the eggs, we want to mix typically around a millicurie of uh, technetium 99M sulfur colloid with the egg whites, stir it well, and then cook. Now, notice I said mix the sulfur colloid in the raw eggs and, why, and then cook. Why is that important? Because the heat uh, breaks the disulfide bonds and helps the TEC99 bind well uh, to the proteins uh, in, in the eggs. If it is just squirted on cooked eggs afterwards, you may not get a good tag and therefore have a partial kind of liquid emptying phase and solid phase. Now, here over to the right is a well-mixed uh, egg uh, that, uh, that it, you, this is uh, in a casserole, little casserole dish. And there's some inhomogeneities uh, because it hasn't been cooked already. And here's a poorly mixed egg uh, meal where there's lots of areas that are not tagged well, just think if this area emptied early or emptied much later than some of these other areas, we would not get the data that we want. For imaging, we're going to use a low energy collimator. This is Technetium 99M, uh, 140 keV photo peak with a 20% uh, energy window standard matrix. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, uh, there are multiple instances of using TEC99M, and these are similar uh, imaging parameters for most of the, uh, for mo all of those uh, the, those studies. We're going to take one minute anterior and posterior images immediately after eating, and then every hour up to four hours. Uh, mini image at thirty minutes as well, and you'll you'll see in uh, the data from the. Uh, the procedure, the multi-society procedure standard, uh, that there is 30-minute uh, uh, normal retention values um, uh, as well. Um, in the original paper, uh, they did uh, actually drop out uh, three hours. So you'll see sometimes see it written as at zero, one, two, and four hours. Um, but the image every hour up to four hours comes from the procedure standard. If the patient cannot be in, imaged in the anterior 
posterior position. We want to use the left anterior oblique. Um, and, and this is uncommon. Typically, uh, this study can be done with a patient standing up. Uh, it can be done uh, supine as well. But occasionally, uh, just because of the patient positioning or other issues, you can't get that anterior and posterior image. And so you want to use that left anterior oblique image. It lays the stomach out nicely uh, and helps uh, deal with issues of a, a differential attenuation uh, correction based on the, the curvature of the stomach uh, better. So what, how do we interpret this study? Well, we know we're going to draw a region of interest and get data. Um, and here we're talking about how much stays around uh, in, in the stomach. And we're going to focus on the right-hand side first because that's going to be delayed imaging. Uh, after two hours, if the patient gets to 10% or below, that is a normal study. Um, in the procedure standard, it's generally recommended to continue imaging till at least um, the patient has reached uh, 10% or uh, less. Uh, there are some published criteria, such as the Bonta criteria, to stop the study at two hours. Um, now, if the patient has retention values above 90%, 60%, 30%, at these specific times, you may also stop the study because that is an abnormal study. Conversely, if the patient has less retention at one hour, at 30 minutes or uh, one hour than 70 or 30% respectively, so the number, they have less activity in their stomach uh, than this, that would suggest rapid emptying. There are not well-defined normal values uh, for children for the standard meal. This is a normal gastric emptying study. Um, we have activity in the stomach. It moves on to the small bowel, and as is not uncommon, some of that bowel somewhat overlies the stomach. We know we're going to get a few extra counts uh, for that. There's nothing we can do uh, uh, about that. Uh, now, notice I said, oh, going out to four hours. Well, at two hours, the percent retention was only 6%. This, this patient emptied normally, and therefore we can stop the study. Now, how did, I, how did we come up with those numbers and the magic geometric mean? We take the square root of the counts from the anterior image and the posterior image, as opposed to just taking the simple average of adding the counts uh, together and then dividing uh, by two. This is a more robust uh, mathematical method and helps to account for the differential um, position and, and therefore attenu attenuation uh, of the, uh, of the uh, gamma rays as they go, go through the body. It does not attenuate correct, um, but allows us to account for uh, that. So that, that's a key aspect uh, difference. Here's an abnormal gastric emptying and all of our images are splayed out to the left uh, from time zero to, ta to, to four hours. And it's important to look at those images and not just a splash screen at the end with regenerative is just drawn around it where you may not be able to see it uh, very effectively because whatever the data that comes out over here has to match what your eyes think uh, over here because of course if we draw a region of interest incorrectly we won't get good data coming out either um, but this is pretty clear uh, that at f well, four hours uh, we have a very high percent retention now again um, this says percent empty, and I leave this in here because many older software systems um, before uh, before they that were developed before the consensus guideline may not be able to do percent retention. And what's percent if you have percent emptying, what's percent retention? One minus the percent emptying. So twenty one percent is greater than ten percent. 
therefore abnormal study. So if it is an abnormal study, we cannot distinguish between a functional gastroparesis and, and an anatomic obstruction. You know, if you have activity, that activity curve that is just flat because essentially nothing exited uh, the, uh, the stomach, it could be either, most definitely. Now, typically patients have already had an EGD by the time uh, that uh, they've, they've had the gastric, gastric emptying study. Um, but if they haven't, then you would want to recommend an EGD in that case. So with rapid gastric emptying, initially it was described after surgery uh, that, that affected uh, the, particularly the pylorus. Um, but it's also been seen with autonomic dysfunction, cyclical vomiting syndrome, where about 30% of these patients uh, will have rapid gastric emptying. The other 70% have normal gastric emptying. Um, so that helps dis distinguish a cyclical vomiting syndrome from a gastroparesis because they should have at least normal uh, gastric emptying, if not fast, uh, as well as with functional dyspepsia. Um, well, not definitively indicated, um, some clinicians find it very beneficial, beneficial to repeat gastric emptying uh, after uh, intervention uh, to, as to assess the effect of intervention, particularly if the patient is still having symptoms. So we're going to switch over to water-only um, gastric emptying. Now, what would be the indication uh, for water-only gastric emptying? Uh, it would be non-tolerance of uh, a meal. Um, this would not be recommended in the appropriate use criteria to directly go to in lieu of uh, a solid gastric emptying with a standard meal. Um, unlike uh, solid gastric emptying where if we did dynamic imaging we would see a lag phase and then a linear um, emptying. Water em empties in a mono exponential curve so very rapidly. Um, we're going to use 300 milliliters uh, of water with one millicurie of typically tech sulfur colloid. You could use tech DTPA. Um, if you wanted to use or had lying around uh, some indium DTPA, uh, you could. Indium's much more expensive. Um, so unless you're using it as part of another study for its longer half-life, uh, generally you would use uh, sulfur uh, technetium-based uh, agent. And then imaging for... 30 minutes typically, uh, that's a recommendation. Some go longer uh, longer than that, but as we'll see, our normative values uh, are all less than 30 minutes. And we're gonna image dynamically one minute anterior and posterior uh, image is one minute per frame. Uh, or if you had a single headed camera, you'd wanna image in the LAO uh, position, similar to if you couldn't position the patient properly for a solid meal. The data behind water-only gastric emptying um, are, are not as robust and multi-center uh, as they are for the standard meal. Um, Though single-center uh, literature is, is present and demonstrated, uh, one, one uh, of the more prominent papers demonstrated a 32% abnormality rate in patients who had normal solid emptying. Uh, and when that came out, uh, the Ziesman article, uh, it it really shook up the thinking um, because the thought was always that water would always become abnormal prior to a normal solid emptying. And we will not go into the, uh, the deeper mechanics of that. There's just no time. So here is a normal water emptying study. As you can see, it gets in and gets out very quickly. And these are just 30 minute images. Processing is similar. We're going to again use our friend the geometric mean, um, but as rather as to have uh, to use a percent retention time, we're going to use uh, a half emptying time. Uh, and in this patient, it did have kind of a little lag phase, a fundal accommodation uh, time uh, before ending in a uh, exponential uh, curve. And both of these. Uh, both the exponential fit, best fit curve uh, and the raw data are well within the normal range. Um, there's not one normal range been, that has been settled, uh, settled on. Uh, if you wanted to say, well, the patient's within two standard deviations, uh, 
uh, of, of normal, you could say 19 minutes, or if you wanted to be uh, a bit more specific and maybe a little less sensitive, uh, you can use 22 minutes and that's three standard deviations uh, from the, the normal value. And here's an abnormal water only. I'm only showing you the anterior, but as you can see, there's anterior and posterior images. Uh, and clearly, this did not get out beautifully like the that like the other uh, study did. And look at that um, T one half of over 50 minutes, uh, very delayed and abnormal. And suddenly, this patient did have a normal solid. Uh, emptying study prior uh, to this. So we're going to move down uh, the gut and look at small bowel uh, transit. Now, small bowel transit is much more complex. It, uh, it moves back and forth. It, of course, swirls around, uh, making following one uh, kind of the leading edge difficult without um, imaging multiple times uh, over a long period of time. Uh, symptoms of inadequate or decreased small bowel transit are similar uh, to functional gastroparesis, uh, functional dyspepsia, and functional gastroparesis, um, and and therefore in patients with a normal gastric emptying study, um, small bowel transit may be beneficial in elucidating their symptoms. The patient prep is the same as as gastric emptying. Now, depending on what our goals are um, for for this study, uh, we, we want to choose a tracer uh, widely, uh, wisely. So if we just want to look at small bowel, uh, we can choose either NDM111 DTPA or Tech 99 sulfur colloid slash DTPA um, in 300 milliliters of water. Recommended to eat with a meal. Um, that in this case not labeled uh, as opposed to without uh, a meal though there are uh, published protocols without a meal um, if we want to look at both gastric motility and small bowel motility we're going to want to radio label the water from our solid standard meal from before and then you know we're going to have our our regular uh, eggs labeled in uh, with Tech 99M uh, for our solid meal, and do uh, and image both, uh, and use two windows: one for Tech 99 and the other for DTPA uh, to assess over time. Our imaging times are going to be longer because it takes longer to uh, to get through the small bowel. So. The first four are similar to gastric emptying, and then we're going to start adding on extra uh, ones where uh, you can, if you're using uh, indium uh, and in a combined uh, indium tech um, procedure, you can just image the indium at five and, and six hours as opposed to, to having a technetium window. And then 24-hour imaging is often needed uh, to help define where the colonic activity begins uh, and the terminal ileum is. So there are two criteria that can be used for interpretation. One is terminal ileum reservoir filling, and you want to see 40% of the activity in the terminal ileum uh, and or in the colon by six hours. So if it's gone past the terminal ileum, we want to include that activity in our region of interest. We can also look at small bowel transit time, uh, and this uses activity in the colon, and, and you're going to need to go to 24 hours for this generally. Um, and there's not one set method, uh, but two common methods are looking at the time between either 10% or 50% gastric emptying, and then the concomitant 10% or 50% of colon filling. Uh, you can use... Uh, the percent of activity in the colon at six hours as a um, estimate uh, for the for the time uh, and and their normal ranges of that are between forty three and ninety five percent of activity in the colon at six hours. What does this look like? Well, here's imaging over five hours. We've got a box around. The whole abdomen to get whole abdomen counts because we need to see what percentages in the whole abdomen versus 
in the terminal ilium right here at the end uh, at five hours. Uh, and for this patient, it was greater than that 40%. So you can stop the study uh, at four at five hours uh, right here. We're going to move on down uh, to colonic transit. Uh, now, frequently this is done as a whole gut transit uh, study where we're looking where you're evaluating gastric, then small bowel, and finally colonic activity. Though it can be done just to look at uh, colonic uh, activity. Since we're going to go out imaging even farther, adding 48 and 72 hour uh, images, we're going to need indium DTPA with, with its 2.8 day half life uh, to be around. That six hour half life of Tech 99 is not going to do it for us. And you can use indium 111 DTPA in water with a meal or in certain centers who can make this type of delayed release capsule. Um, you can use Indium 111 uh, DTPA charcoal particles uh, and the capsule is set to uh, degrade at uh, certain pH values so it uh, ends up near uh, the term, uh, the terminal ileum when it releases the, the particles out. <clears throat> then from the 24, 48, and 72 hour imaging, uh, we're going to derive some data. And how are we going to do that? We're going to divide the colon in either five or seven areas. These are the two uh, most well described and determine the geometric center of that activity. And what is the geometric center? Interesting concept. Um, it's a weighted average of the radioactivity in specific areas of the colon. Pictures are worth a thousand words. So here is a determination of the geometric center. Um, in a drawing form, you can see that this is a seven um, segmented colon with seven being activity that's left. Luckily, we do not need to measure the activity, the stool itself. We can just see what residual act activity uh, is left, decay correcting that, um, and state that whatever is not in the colon uh, or, or not in the whole abdomen has gone out, and we can uh, subtract that subtract that out. And the general idea behind geometric centers, you can see it's a weighted, weighted average, is that smaller numbers mean the activity is closer to the cecum. And of course, things should move from the cecum on out uh, in a relatively orderly fashion. Uh, so each, each criteria has, or each each processing has different reference values, which I'm, I'm not going to go to memorizing is not uh, that important. Um, uh, but suffice it to say, uh, lower numbers at later times are not a good thing. Uh, here is a normal study, uh, where as you can see tracer activity moving through the colon uh, and a geometric center, a pretty high number. Uh, whereas so a patient like this with colonic inertia, it, it's barely into the transverse colon at 24 hours. It's still slight, I mean, it's still trying to make the turn, uh, and at 72 hours, uh, it's still primarily you know in the transverse uh, colon. A B normal study. Let's shift gears completely to GI bleeding scintigraphy. So, what what's the indication? It's for active active gastrointestinal bleeding in patients with overt bleeding that is expected to be from a mid or lower GI source. Now, what, why, why overt GI bleeding? Well, occult GI bleeding thing uh, that, that might be found uh, on a um, school, stool guaiac uh, test is uh, it, we're not going to sufficiently uh, image that um, and just because it is, that, that bleeding is very intermittent uh, and maybe very, very low volume. You need evidence that the patient has recently bled uh, to, to do this study properly. And studies that are appropriately referred uh, for this, the bleeding is intermittent. Um, these are not patients who are uh, notably actively bleeding and completely unstable. Uh, they need to go uh, to an intervention uh, to, to deal with that. The radiopharmaceutical is best in vitro labeled uh, Tech 99 autologous red blood cells, where you take the patient's red blood cells out, you mix it on the lab bench uh, with a kit, and you get you know, 
greater than 99% uh, labeling efficiency. And then you re-inject those same red blood cells back into the patient. Uh, and of course, it's critical to use safeguards um, as we do not want to give the wrong blood to the wrong patient. Uh, and there are a variety of of protocols on to uh, to ensure this safety. You know, some use double signatures, like you'd use for a blood transfusion uh, at the steps to track uh, the the activity. Uh, if the patient does not wish to accept um, their own red blood cells reinjected, you can label in vivo. Uh, your your tagging efficiency is lower at about 90 percent. Uh, uh, sulfur colloid was used uh, initially described in the 1970s, because but it has such a, a short residence time um, in the uh, in the blood. Uh, you have to be bleeding within those 15 minutes. Uh, though repeated administrations are feasible for adults, 15 to 30 millicuries. Uh, children lower uh, than that, and. One thing about GI bleeding scintigraphy, it's very, very sensitive. Our lower limit of detection is 0.1 milliliters per minute, which is six milliliters of bleeding an hour. Um, that is lower than uh, everything else, uh, which sometimes pose a problem for very slow bleeds uh, because they're below the detection uh, of, uh, say, interventional radiology by fluoroscopy. Uh, so they, they can't find that bleed to definitively treat it. What's our protocol? Um, the initial dynamic uh, phase with nuclear you know, flow or nuclear angiography, where we're taking a one to three second per frame uh, images for the first 60 seconds can be useful for delineating what those vascular structures are uh, in the body and using that to compare uh, to uh, findings uh, that, that we may see uh, and, and wonder, is that just blood pool or is that intraluminal bleeding. <clears throat> dynamic, uh, subsequent to that, we're going to do dynamic anterior imaging um, with a frame rate not to exceed one minute uh, per frame for generally 60 to 90 minutes. Um, you could do this longer if, if the patient's tolerating it, uh, though the, uh, the bang for your buck after 90 minutes is pretty low. And now, of course, if you identify bleeding and you've accurately characterized it, you may stop the study. You do not need to co continue uh, imaging. Um, you, you need to, to get the patient to appropriate treatment. Now, you can use 10 to 20 second, uh, 10 to 20 per second frames um, to help improve the localization of the bleeding site. Why? Uh, because uh, the blood is cathartic, it induces peristalsis, and the blood moves on. So sometimes at one minute, uh, you, you've already got movement of the blood away from the, uh, the initial bleeding site. Now, conversely, if you have a very slow bleed, uh, 10 to 20 seconds per frame may not uh, demonstrate that accurately. However, we can take data uh, from frames and add them together to produce longer time frames. So you can image it 10 to 20 seconds of frame, reformat that into one or even five, five minute uh, images and help detect slower bleeds. So other imaging, particularly lateral pelvic imaging may uh, aid and identify rectal bleeding, or if there's a question about uh, penile blush, uh, help sort that out. Um, delayed imaging is controversial, uh, either af you know, sometime after uh, the, the initial uh, time period of imaging on the same day or, uh, or within the next 24 hours. Um, we know that the, the specificity is lower uh, on, you know, for localization in the site at 24 hours, um, though there are some, uh, there is some literature to support its use. So what does a normal gastric MG, or gastric, uh, GI bleeding study uh, look like? Well, we, the, the heart is going to be the hottest organ because there's a lot of activity in the heart, not surprisingly. Um, the liver the spleen, the vasculature, uh, the kidneys also get a fair amount of activity, right? It gets, uh, you know, good, uh, good 20% of, 
of the blood so they may be seen. Now, generally, they don't move around. Patients move around. Uh, so here we don't see any intraluminal bleeding. Now you'll say, Dr. Brandon, something's up. There's a big photopenic area right there. Well, this patient had a left nephrectomy. It has a very large uh, retroperitoneal hematoma. Um, that also it's not bleeding into that, uh, at least uh, at, at this time. Um, so here's a subtle GI bleed. And, and this is one where having a baseline flow image uh, can be useful and tracking very, uh, very carefully where the activity is. And it may be hard to see on your screen, but if you look in this area, there is subtly increased uptake. Um, now this is going to be below, and this is, this is the first 60 minutes. This is another 30 minutes. Um, so the activity right there is where this very subtle bleed uh, is. Now there are a few other findings uh, on this uh, that are important. One is we see a big photopenic area again. I swear not every case I have has a big photopenic area. Um, and what is this? Well, this is ascites. Uh, and why is there some mild haze in the middle? Uh, because all of our bowel is squished together uh, because of this notable ascites uh, that the patient has. So in cirrhotics, it can be much more difficult to localize bleeding. All right, what's your interpretation on this study? I've finally shown you one that doesn't have a photopenic area. But what's going on besides the patient dancing to the right? The tracer isn't moving. I said that blood in, in the bowel leads to peristaltic movement. Uh-oh. Well, here's one time where a spec CT can definitely be useful. And there's literature uh, to support that in select instances, spec CT can be uh, useful. And so what we have is intraluminal activity in the colon um, next to a diverticulum. Now, uh, there's actually multiple diverticulum. There's strandy changes here. These were new uh, from uh, an abdomen CT roughly one month uh, before. So what's probably happening here uh, is inflammation is leading to inadequate movement uh, of uh, the colon in the setting of a diverticular uh, bleed. So in, in talking about colonic versus, um, versus small bowel bleeds, uh, typically a colonic bleed goes around. Now, of course, it can move anterior grade and, uh, uh, and retrograde, but it's going to go around our expected location of the colon and and, uh, and while you can have redundant loops of bowel either transverse colon or the sigmoid colon um, it's usually pretty wide now the small bowel is all swirly and actually it frequently is very difficult to show in these uh, in these things because there's often faint activity and it moves very quickly so here's another image of something not moving activity not moving and as opposed to showing you another video. Here's an image from five minutes and the image from 60 minutes. And we have this activity that doesn't move uh, the entire time, which is very weird. Well, again, we can look at other, other data to help us out. We've got that clear space again. So yet another ascites and our bowel squished in the middle. Uh, and this does seem to link up to the vasculature and go all the way up to the liver. Um, so this ends up uh, being a uh, in a patient, a cirrhotic patient. Uh, we've got uh, a uh, collateral, uh, a notable collateral uh, from the left iliac or, or possibly even uh, uh, femoral uh, artery all the way up uh, to the liver where we're you know, probably going in right next to the uh, the caudate lobe, which has more activity than we would expect. Shifting again, um, Meckel's diverticulum and detecting ectopic mucosa in Meckel's diverticulum. So Meckel's di diverticulum are, are really common. Uh, they're vestigial remnants of uh, the omphalomesoteric uh, duct, and they're seen in 1% to 3% of the population, making it 
the most common congenital GI abnormality. Um, typically, they're within 180 centimeters of the ileocecal valve. Uh, they're a couple centimeters long, uh, and 57% of those uh, Meckel's diverticulum have ectopic gastric mucosa. And what's the problem with that? Well, it's going to put out hydrochloric acid. Uh, it's not in a protected environment like uh, the stomach, which leads to erosions of, uh, of the diverticula and adjacent ileum, hence bleeding. Now, half the patients present by two years old, and the older the patient is at the age of presentation, um, the less likely you are to have a positive study in general. In appropriately selected patients, our sensitivity is around 85%. Our specificity is very good, uh, and our accuracy uh, is 90%. And as per, for specificity, um, one of the main fake outs is uh, ectopic gastric mucosa in uh, a GI duplication cyst, which is probably good to know about either which way. So why are we using technetium-99 and protectinate? Well, it's taken up by mucin-producing cells uh, of the, the gastric uh, mucosa. How much are we going to use? Um, there's a pediatric formula in adults, generally 8 to 12 uh, millicuries. The patient prep, fasting is not necessary, um, and in young children may not be beneficial, um, but we also don't want to have a completely full stomach as this will extend, expand the stomach. Uh, and in very small children, that could obscure the area that we want to see because the stomach has a lot of mucin producing cells and a lot of gastric mucosa. Uh, and therefore, we know we will image it on the study. Pharmacologic interventions are not required. And um, on the multi-study practice parameter, uh, sorry, not practice, uh, procedure standard, not recommended. However, they may be used, uh, and that may be the use of H2 blockers or um, PPIs to controlled acid secretion, uh, which with increased acid secretion, you get uh, movement of the radio tracer out of uh, the mucin producing cells. You can also use glucagon to slow intestinal transit, though not in diabetic patients. But again, these are not required uh, to do high quality imaging. Um, we're going to do anterior dynamic flow images at, at the beginning, because so similar to uh, a GI bleeding study uh, for 60 seconds. And this helps us again to define the vascular blood pool. And then after that, we're going to do anterior dynamic imaging at 30 to 60 uh, seconds per frame for at least 30 minutes and up to 60 minutes uh, due to um, the, the, uh, tech 99 and entering the bowel from the gastric mucosa uh, physiologically after about 60 minutes um, you're going to have you, you may have interference uh, for this so prolonged imaging is not going to be beneficial and, and could be uh, could lead to incorrect determination plus if it hasn't shown up by 60 minutes it not it is not likely uh, to uh, to show up now Spot images uh, after your dynamic imaging can be very beneficial to help localize foci of activity or uh, try to evaluate posterior to the bladder uh, where activity is going to be. SPECT or SPECT CT images um, may be beneficial uh, and uh, as stated by the, uh, by the procedure standard in detecting May a small diverticulum or one obscured by a structure such as uh, the bladder. There's not a recommendation for uh, SPECT or SPECT CT imaging on every patient, um, but for troubleshooting. This is a Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, so in our early images, it's uh, distributed through the blood pool. And then we start to see uptake in the stomach. And then eh, there's something faint here. And then over time, this faint thing becomes notable. And posterior images don't really help very much. Um, lateral images show the, the activity to be uh, anteriorly uh, placed. This is most consistent with uh, a Meckel's diverticulum. We're shifting uh, to liver hemangioma imaging. Yes, this is liver, and we're talking about GI in general. Um, but as we're using tech red blood cells, I've thrown it in. So why would we do this? 
Um, this is indicated when conventional imaging is inconclusive and a hepatic lesion um, that it's at least 1.4 centimeters uh, generally, uh, and, and that you have to be using uh, spec CT uh, to get to this uh, low number. Um, and and they, there's a question of whether this is a hemangioma or not. If the study is positive, the positive predictive value is near 100%. There are very few fake outs uh, for the pattern of uptake. And our sensitivity is pretty darn good with SPECT, 88%. With planar only imaging, it's, it's only 55%. So we do not want to be running planar only protocols. Similar to GI bleeding, uh, we're going to use around 25 millicuries of uh, uptake of uh, uh, 25 millicuries of tagged red blood cells. And classically, uh, hemangiomas are going to be cold on initial uh, imaging uh, and then increase uh, over time to preferably hot, but sometimes just relatively similar uh, to liver. And on that delayed imaging, it's about one or two hours after. And why is this? Well, hemangiomas are very disordered, um, very disordered uh, blood sinusoid systems as opposed to beautiful, you know, vasculature uh, where where red blood cells would flow freely. And so it takes a while for activity to go through the vasculature uh, or through these sinusoids uh, to get to the center and therefore increased on delayed imaging and also accumulates because it takes a while for those uh, red blood cells to get back out. So protocols often include initial flow imaging versus planar, uh, and planar um, that can be scrapped uh, versus just a spec or spec CT, uh, and then delayed planar plus minus as well as spec or spec CT uh, one to two hours after injection. This is a nice case of uh, a. Um, hemangioma on delayed imaging. I'm not showing you the early imaging uh, because you would see a slightly photopenic area, but it, but it's hard to see. And I fuse this here with diagnostic uh, CT. This, this uh, is not a, uh, not, not the, uh, the CT that was done uh, with, uh, with this SPECT. Um, and as I said, Flow imaging may or may not be useful, but this patient had a GI bleeding study a few months later. Um, and you can see on the 60 minutes, there's only mild accumulation on what's, you know, on the planar image uh, of, uh, of blood pool uh, in, this, in this area. We'll shift again to liver and spleen imaging. Uh, and when we inject sarfocaloid, intravenously, uh, as opposed to you know, in the uh, subcutaneously or intradermally uh, for lymphocentigraphy, uh, the reticulate endothelial system extracts that sulfur colloid very, very efficiently. Uh, and what is it? Uh, and, and where's our reticulate endothelial system? Where it's the, well, it's the coop for cells in, in the liver, which account for about 10% of, of the liver cells. Uh, and that's going to take about 80 to 85 percent of the sulfur colloid uh, that we injected out of the blood. Uh, the first pass extraction of liver is very high, uh, upwards of 95, uh, 95 percent. Uh, and then the macrophages in the spleen and bone marrow, the spleen taking about 10 to 15 percent of uh, our uh, of the uh, the sulfur colloid that's injected with bone marrow, only getting about five uh, five percent. And this extraction efficiency is very high. Uh, so by about 15 minutes, you've taken essentially all of the sulfur colloid out of the blood. We're going to inject four to six millicuries of tech sulfur colloid. Uh, it doesn't need to be filtered. Uh, and in truth, if you preferentially had smaller particles, those will, those will go to the bone marrow more as opposed to larger particles, uh, which are uh, favor, uh, filtered by the liver more efficiently. Um, if you go above uh, that six millicuries, especially, you know, above eight millicuries, <clears throat> we're going to get a lot more bone marrow activity. And we don't want to see notable bone marrow activity, it will reduce our ability to assess for reticular endothelial shift. Now, we can use sulfur colloid for bone marrow imaging, but that's a completely different talk. Now, this is an old study. It was around uh, starting in the 60s prior to CT imaging and was 
crucial for a whole variety of things that don't matter anymore. We don't need to use uh, USFR colloid to uh, measure uh, the liver or the spleen. Um, uh, there was a time when that was important. So why would we want to do it? So to evaluate reticular endothelial shift in liver dysfunction. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and this is an occasional uh, need um, to evaluate the spleen um, reticular endothelial system. Is it too little? Is it too much? And you know, they have functional asplenia, which you may see in something like... Uh, um, sickle cell anemia, and also the distribution of uh, splenic tissues. If they've had, if they have polysplenia, or there's a question of something's a splenule, uh, or they've had trauma, uh, and, uh, and they're trying to figure out where are all the little spleen bits uh, that that may have been uh, that are scattered in the abdomen. Um, and this, I've used it uh, before to try to figure out is something a metastasis uh, versus most likely uh, a, a splenule or a you know, a, a, in someone who uh, who had uh, who had trauma, so there were some questions. And then, lastly, to delineate the extent or presence of extramedullary hematopoiesis, um, so that also would would be within the reticular endothelial uh, system. So, what's our protocol? So, we're going to inject uh, our sulfur colloid and wait about 20 minutes. We know that uh, by 15 minutes, we should have extracted it all, and so we'll get good images. Uh, and then we're going to, depending on what our goal is, we're going to take multiplanar images of the lower, uh, lower chest and abdomen. Uh, and then it, we can totally just use a SPECT or SPECT CT, uh, again, depending on our indication. Uh, and this is a pretty normal study. Uh, we have liver activity more than the spleen. All right, the spleen's a little big. Uh, and as you see right here, a, a older thing, uh, which is a ruler that we can use to measure the size. These days, there's not a great reason to, to measure the size. Uh, you could say, yes, it's abnormal, uh, but the exact size should be uh, performed on conventional imaging. Now here, there's faint activity in the bone marrow, uh, though maybe a little more than we might want to see. Uh, <clears throat> but it probably isn't reticular endothelial shift. It's just a good camera, and I've windowed it down a little so you can faintly see the bone marrow. All right, so what's wrong with this patient? Interpretation time. Well, our, our liver to spleen ratio is normal, right? The liver is a lot more uh, than than the spleen, or, and this is gets you know eighty upwards of eighty percent, and this is only about fifty percent. So the liver should be a lot hotter. But we see a lot of bone marrow, but that doesn't make sense because if you have reticular endothelial shift with increase in splenic and bone marrow activity, um, you should see more. Uh, you know, should, this is normal liver activity and normal spleen activity, so that doesn't make sense. And what's happened here is we have 10 millicuries injected. We've gone above our four to six millicuries and therefore do not have um, uh, the normal amount of activity in the bone marrow. So we've got to keep our activity injected correctly. This is what? Interpret, please. Well, this is reticular endothelial shift. We have the liver, it is markedly down as opposed to the spleen, and we see a lot of bone marrow uh, activity. Uh, this, this patient had an infiltrative liver disease as well as thrombocytopenia, uh, and this increased activity within the spleen uh, may, be, uh, may be the cause of the thrombocytopenia uh, due to increased reticular endothelial system activity. So probably a, a more common indication is splenic rest uh, in the pancreas. Now, again, if conventional imaging has already sorted this out, we don't need to do this study. This is for when conventional in, uh, activity is uh, incon con conventional imaging is inconclusive. And you can see that there is focal activity in the tip of the spleen uh, where there was a lesion seen on uh, conventional imaging. Uh, and this is has a positive predictive value for being splenic tissue exceedingly high. Pancreatic tumors don't have reticular endothelial uh, system, it, and therefore you can exclude those.
Okay, I know. That was busy and a whirlwind for much of it. I did not have time to cover multiple other topics, but study them as you will. So, question one, for a bedbound patient who, who just can't be positioned for our regular anterior and posterior geometric mean corrected gastric imaging, which one of the following is the best alternative? Anterior only images, posterior images, left anterior oblique images, left lateral images. Again, left anterior oblique images it are it, over time is a correct choice. If we can only choose one, we shouldn't choose just anterior or posterior. Um, the left an anterior oblique image does a better job when you're using it uh, as a, the sole imaging uh, plane uh, to lay out the stomach um, in, a, in a fashion that is best uh, to image. If you just do anterior or posterior images, you'll either have activity on anterior images coming from the posterior forward or on posterior images moving anteriorly, uh, and there will look uh, like there'll be much larger shifts of activity than there truly are. Okay, for gastric emptying, which of the following is most accurate? When a patient consumes a meal consisting of liquids and solids, the liquid, the liquid phase will empty more rapidly than the solid phase. The rate of gastric emptying will be independent of patient positioning. Geometric mean correction is the sum of the, two of the anterior and posterior counts divided by two. The rate of gastric emptying will be independent of nutrient density. Okay, make your choice. So, per the literature, if a patient consumes a meal consisting of liquids and solids, uh, the liquid phase will empty more rapidly than the solid phase. Now, there is a caveat that there can be abnormal liquid emptying in some patients, possibly up to 32% uh, uh, of patients uh, when the solid phase is normal. But generally, this is uh, the answer that they'd be looking for. Now, we didn't talk about it, but the rate of gastric emptying is not independent of patient positioning. Uh, if you patient, put the patient on their left side, they will empty uh, less rapidly than uh, on their back or, of course, uh, upright. The geometric mean is what? It's the square root of the anterior times the posterior counts. And the rate of gastric emptying most definitely is dependent on nutrients and nu nutrient density with fat emptying the slowest. And if we just drink water, um, there's no nutrients in that and therefore they don't affect the rate of gastric uh, emptying. Third question, for imaging of a liver hemangioma with uh, TEC-99 labeled red blood cells, which of the following statements is true? The flow phase of the lesion typically shows decreased activity. The early blood pool phase of the lesion typically shows increased activity. The combination of early increased arterial flow and increased delayed filling is characteristic of the mangioma. Most false negatives in imaging of this kind, uh, this kind of lesion result from thrombosis of the lesion. Okay. So again, cold early, so decreased activity, hot later is our characteristic. Um, and delayed, increased delayed feeling. Oh, right. So while there is increased delayed feeling, there is not early increased arterial flow. Um, not that there can't be flash filling hemangiomas, they're more uncommon, and typically those are already well assessed on uh, conventional imaging, so they don't make it to us. And false negatives um, overall in the literature uh, are actually uh, often described as more of these flash filling hemangiomas, so you don't get that typical pattern of um, cold and hot over time. All right, thank you and have a wonderful day.